Hello everyone, welcome, warm welcome to all of you to the International Webinar on Physics and Life at Nanoscale of Length organized by Department of Physics, Piyatakur Government College, West Bengal, in India. I request all the participants on the Google Meet to mute your microphone to our noise and to let this program run smoothly. Today, we have two consequent lecture sessions by two honorable speakers. First lecture will be delivered by Prof. Shruti Chattopadhyay from Institute of Biophotonics, National Young University, Taipei, Taiwan. And in second session, she will hear from Dr. Shruta Dharvanman, Scientific Manager, Division of Biology, Department of Infectious Disease, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, Hospital, USA. So I sincerely hope that we are about to experience a great session ahead with our two respected speakers. I request, I request all the participants, all the participants from Google Meet and YouTube to leave, to leave your, your comments, comments and, and questions in the chat box, box during your lecture. lecture. We'll get we'll back, back to you once the lecture, lecture is over. Is over. Now, I now I request from Shom Chodhathai, Head, Department of Physics, Piyatagur Government College, to deliver the welcome address and take the charge of the first lecture session. Over to you, Shom sir. Please continue. Oh, thank you. On behalf of the Physics Department of P.R. Thakur Government College, I welcome all of you and uh, particularly our students at different colleges, uh, particularly in the, co the colleges that I have taught earlier also. So basically we are two speakers. They are uh, as Bengali as you. So my main intention was uh, before uh, behind the organizing of this seminar was to show you that uh, from the Bengali soil, one can achieve uh, greatness for uh, with high determination and hard work. So uh, the speakers, though resides abroad, they are actually So if you try hard and have determination, then you can also achieve as they have achieved today. So we have our first speaker, Professor Suroji I have had very solid relations with him uh, for the last 30 years. Suruji Chattavadai uh, did his MSc and PhD from Calcutta University and uh, did his research work from Indian Association of Cultivation of Science and obtained his degree in 1996. He had been a Chevening scholar at the University of Dude at UK 
and worked in different fields and different institutes like Institute of Atomic and Molecular Sciences, the Center for Condensed Matter Sciences, National Taiwan University. Currently, he is the senior professor at the National Yangming University, Taipei, Taiwan. His past interests varied in different fields like in solar cells, anti-reflection coatings, photodetectors, protective cells, etc. Et Thereafter, he switched his interests in functional nanomaterials which is the subject matter of today and his, his biomedical applications, imaging, drug delivery, etc. So, so starting from the journey from the physics, I expect he will sail through the reality of uh, bioscience, an interdisciplinary one, which is the present go of the day. So I will request Professor Chattopadhyay to take the stage. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Thank you, Shamor, for introducing me. And I hope uh, my voice is reaching you clearly. Yes, sir. Can you hear, can you hear you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> thank you all. And uh, today, what I'd like to do is uh, I will give you a very basic uh, overview of uh, functional nanomaterials. That means the nanomaterials that can be used for different uh, applications. Uh, my affiliation has been given, so uh, I would not waste time on those, and I would directly go on to the topic. I hope most of us know the scale of things that we work on. So going from meters down to femtometers. However, uh, today I will like to uh, focus mostly on this area, okay, which is like uh, from one nanometer to maybe a, a hundred nanometer scale. And I will try to discuss what can be done in, in this scale of lengths. So let me start by giving you a background, the fundamental of uh, nanomaterials from a quantum mechanical point of view. We all know the particle in a box, right? Uh, when we were in the undergrad uh, college uh, physics, uh, uh, physics or something, maybe some of you have done in chemistry also. So we know that uh, if you have a small box in which an electron is moving, and we can solve the time independent Schrodinger equation, which is written over here. And we can solve it and apply the boundary conditions and then get to the energy of the electrons. Okay, so the energy of the electrons are given over here, which you can see has an inverse square dependence on the size of the box. The size of the box is A. Okay, so when you know the energy of the electrons and which is inverse One proportional. Second. Those who are participating, please switch off your camera and mute yourself also. Except the speaker, everyone is requested to mute the microphone and also the camera. Supriyo, please switch off your camera. Can I continue? Yes. Okay. We know the energy of these electrons, and then if you replace the n value, the principal quantum number with one, two, three, then we get the ground state energy and the excited state energies. So we can see that not only the excited state or the ground state energy itself, but even the separation of the energy states uh, have a dependence on A, that means the size of the box. Okay, so all of these. Uh, electronic properties, which depends on the electronic energy, will change if you change A. So the question now comes that what happens when A, the size of the box, becomes very small? Because we are working in the nanoscale, so we would like to make crystals which are very, very small. And what happens to the electronic energy when the crystal becomes very small? So when uh, 
So we answer this question that what happens when A becomes very small, where A is the dimension of the box. What happens is basically you get a lot of research on nanoscale and you get uh, so many journals publishing this kind of nanomaterials. And it all started with the 1959 lecture of uh, Professor Feynman, who mentioned that there is plenty of room at the bottom. By the, bot by the word bottom, what he meant is that uh, there is a lot of physics that can be done at the nanoscale compared to what the science has been right at that time, which was in the bulk, that means in the big scale. So what he proposed is that, is it possible for us to see and manipulate in the nanoscale, that means in the atomic scale. For example, you have your finger, just like in this picture, that can you manipulate, move, or see clusters or at atomic clusters with that ease? So if you can do that, then that will change the whole world of physics. So with this great big idea that was proposed in 1959, all the scientists now started to work in that area. And soon we had the scanning, scanning tunneling microscope, which is a tool basically, uh, which won uh, Gard, Binig, and uh, Rohrer the Nobel Prize in 1986. So what, uh, what can be done is they used a, a scanning tunneling microscope, STM tip, to manipulate xenon atoms, okay? So when you manipulate these xenon atoms and you can deposit them on, a, on an ultra cold nickel surface, and then you can write the word IBM, okay? So these blue dots that you see, these are nothing but xenon atoms deposited on a nickel, very, very cold nickel surface. So now you can understand what this machine can do, the STM. They can actually hold and manipulate, that means reposition, these small atoms at places that they like. So this, this was done by Dan Aguilar at the IBM. And you know you can also make these quantum corals. So we know that this was possible. So we got the tool, so no problem. Now, now we see that how these materials can be made and uh, applications can be derived. To give you a small uh, understanding of what is happening at the nanoscale, if, if you know, that you can have a cube which has a surface area, let's say, of six centimeters square over here. That's bulk. Now break it up into small pieces. Your surface area is increasing. If you make it to very, very tiny pieces, for example, over here, then you see the surface area has increased tremendously. So if you go from here, you'll see that the surface area has increased a lot. And all the properties that we see of uh, nanomaterials half of them, I mean, most of them, depend on this increased surface area. So what we say basically is, what is nano? So nano is a material whose surface to volume ratio is very high. If you compare to bulk materials, the volume is higher than the surface. So volume by surface ratio will be much higher for bulk, that means for this one. However, if you go to nano, then the surface to volume ratio will be higher. And we will see how this will change the properties of these materials. For example, what, what kind of properties can you expect in nanoscale? Let's say we are considering the melting point of gold. Gold is a metal we all know. It, uh, it has a melting point of nearly uh, 1100 degrees centigrade. But if you decrease the size of gold in this way, you see that the melting point of gold decrease. So you can have of three nanometer gold melt at 800 degrees, which is much lower than the bulk melting point of gold. Similarly, if you take, for example, cadmium sulfide, the semiconductor, it, it can also have a very low melting point compared to the bulk. So these are the new, new properties we are generating out of these materials uh, made in the nanoscale, which was not possible in the bulk. Let me give you some <clears throat> example of emission. For example, we have uh, material semiconductor nanocrystals called quantum dots, okay? And they emit very nice, very sharp, uh, bright lines of colors. And if you note that all these bottles containing uh, quantum dots, they are giving emissions at uh, violet and then blue and then green, yellow, orange, red, all kinds of colors they can emit, okay? However, the material is one. One material is giving so many colors of emission that was impossible using bulk. 
So how, how is that possible if you note, okay, all these materials, we have plotted the absorption, okay? These materials will absorb light. So if you plot the absorption as a function of wavelength, then you see a small quantum dot, which is around, say, 12 angstrom size, that means 1.2 nanometers, they have absorption peak around 400 nanometer. If you convert 400 nanometer to energy, you will see that's around 3.2 electron volts or something like that. Now, if you make the same material bigger, okay, if you make it bigger, so you go this way, you go this way, so you see the biggest nanoparticle that we have is around 150 nanostrom, which is around 11.5 nanometers, and they have absorption band around 650, which is like 2, two EV. So you see that the band gap of these materials, I, I hope you understand what's the band gap. So the band gap of these materials, the shift, once the particle is becoming smaller, the band gap is becoming larger. The particle becoming smaller, the band gap is becoming larger. Okay, this we call a blue shift. Blue only indicates that the absorption energy is moving towards high energy. Okay, so when you move this way in, in this uh, panel of picture, you will know that's a blue shift. Blue doesn't mean the color. Blue only means that you are going from lower energy to towards higher energy. So on the other way, if you move around this direction, then you will get a red shift. So once the particles are becoming smaller, the emission color is going towards the UV. Once the particle is becoming bigger, the emission color is going towards red. So this is basically what you can achieve in nanomaterials. And these are all due to the quantum confinement. This is a new term. Maybe I can introduce here. Quantum confinement is where that A, the, the, the box dimension becomes very small. Okay. And then you change the property of the material. In this case, the band gap. When the band gap changes, the emission colors changes. This was impossible uh, in the bulk scale, but in the nano scale, we can do that. Moving on, <clears throat> you might ask me, so what is a nano material? If the size of a crystal is one nanometer, is it a nano material? Or if it is 100 nanometer, 1000 nanometer, can we call it a nano material? Okay, so let me first define what's a nano material okay so in this in this plot on the left you see we have plotted the absorption energy as a function of crystal size in nanometers for different materials so you have gallium arsenide here you have gallium arsenide and you see as the gallium arsenide crystal becomes smaller the energy this absorption energy sort of stays the same and then suddenly increase and this behavior is the same for all. You take cadmium selenide, it also increased somewhere over here, okay? And for gallium arsenide, maybe the change is over here. You go to cadmium sulfide, the change in the energy is happening somewhere over here, okay? And so on. So now the question is, what is happening at these points? It kind of a mean, okay? A mean that where the properties were fixed and then suddenly it goes up. So what is happening at that, that point? For that, we need to understand some basic uh, property of the material. And I would int uh, introduce a word called bore radius, okay? Which is over here, the bore radius. And now look at the table on the right, okay? Here is a bore radius and here are the materials. Let's see. What are the bore radius for different materials? Gallium arsenide. Where is gallium arsenide? Gallium arsenide is here. 12.5 nanometers is the bore radius. So we see that 12.5 is somewhere over here on the dimension scale. Now you see the properties start to change from 12.5 nanometers and below. So if the size of the gallium arsenide crystal is below uh, that bore radius, the change in the electronic properties are drastic. Above the bore radius, maybe the change is there, but still a little. But below the bore radius, the change is drastic. Now, take for example cadmium selenide. So look for cadmium selenide. Cadmium selenide has a bore radius of five nanometers, 4.9. Okay. So I expect 
that when the cadmium selenide crystal goes to 5 nanometer, I expect the change in the property. So it's over here. It's over here. Similarly for other materials, right? So once you get to uh, the bore radius, the electronic properties change a lot. Now, for the students who, who want to do, let's say, I mean, I can hope that you want to do a PhD in nanoscience, then uh, it would be very copper chloride, okay? Copper chloride is the topmost plot. Why? Because if you look at this plot, copper chloride property doesn't change at all. Let's see where is the copper chloride bore radius, okay? Copper chloride is the last one, is over here. You see the bore radius, 0.7 nanometer. So where is 0.7 nanometer in this scale? 0.7 nanometer is somewhere over here. So the copper chloride property will change somewhere over there. But 0.7 nanometer means 7 angstrom. That means if you want to be an experimentalist, you have to make 7 angstrom size copper chloride, which is very, very, very tough. You can try, but it's tough. So, for example, if you want to get, uh, get your PhD quite easily, I would rather suggest do a PhD on nano gallium arsenide, much easier. Now, <clears throat> would you like to do something or even try to make nano hydrogen? The bore radius for hydrogen is mentioned here, which is 0 0.05 nanometer. That means 0.5 angstrom. I am not sure if any, uh, any of us can make 0.5 angstrom of hydrogen. Okay. So now we have defined uh, nanomaterial in a very strict sense, like the bore radius, okay? So anything near the bore radius is really, by quantum mechanical definition, a nano. So can't we call something like 100 nanometer a nano? Well, they are, but quantum mechanical definition is when the material size is below the bore radius, then that's nano. Moving on, I'll give you more information on quantum dots. Quantum dots are semiconductor nanocrystals, semiconductor, okay, which when excited by UV light, ultraviolet, gives you visible emission. And these emission, this is not staggering. These emissions are sharp, very, very sharp, intense, and doesn't bleach at all. So you can see, you can get all these beautiful colors from quantum dots. And mind you, they're coming from a single material, okay? Why? Because the band gap, as I said, that the band gap uh, will uh, increase if the A, the, the dimension of the box becomes small. So as you move this way, you see the band gap is increasing. This is what is called blue shift. So I can have a blue shift like that, okay? So you can have the, uh, the same material, you make it very small size, it will give you uh, energy of a higher value, okay, the emission energy. And when you look at these solutions, these are bright, very beautiful solutions. What can we do with it? Of course, you can do imaging. So I, I give you a very brief picture over here that you can put, put them inside cells and make the cells fluoresce. And then you can watch the cells under a microscope. So that's one of the very beautiful uses of quantum dots. I will show you more. For example, you can do <clears throat> bioimaging. And bioimaging is not, not that easy, right? So one of, them, uh, the, one of the property that we say that we must do multiplexing. The word is over here, multiplexing. Multiplexing means you need to put two or three, more than one, two or three different colors of quantum dots into one cell and still image them because they will have a single excitation, which is in the ultraviolet. So you sh shine ultraviolet light to the quantum dot and they will give you different colors. For example, in this picture, you can see, uh, I can see red, I can see blue, I can see green, yellow, all this multiplexing is possible. Now, that, when I can put the quantum dots inside the cell, it's obvious that I could put, the, put those in different organs of a living being, for example, a mouse. So now I can put the quantum dots over here or over there, and I can image them. So it makes us, uh, there's a possibility that I can put the, quantum dots inside tumors, and then I image those tumors by fluorescence. You might be thinking, okay, how stable are these quantum dots, okay? This one is a very uh, good, uh, good paper from Nature Biotechnology where they take a cell and they put the quantum dots in the nucleus, okay? And 
the microtubules that you see in this picture, look at the picture A, the microtubules you see, they are stained with a dye called alexafluor. Alexafluor emits green color. So you see all this green color from here is coming from a dye, but this red color from the nucleus is coming from the quantum dot, QD, we say QD, quantum dot. Now, if you scan them as a function of time, what do you see? You see the green is vanishing, but the red is still there. So that means quantum dots are more stable than normal organic dyes like Alexa Fluor. Now, some of you may challenge me that, okay, that is not possible because uh, this is happening because I put the quantum dot inside the nucleus. Okay, let's reverse it. Okay, now I put the quantum dot on the microtubules and the Alexa Fluor in the nucleus. And that's the second panel. What do you see? What do you see here? What you see is basically the quant emission is still intact. However, the new, uh, uh, green emission from the Alexa floor has decayed. So quantum dots are quite stable. So that's why they find a lot of applications. <clears throat> so let me move from quantum dot to another semiconductor nanomaterial. And this is a very popular catch line, sunlight to petrol, okay? Sunlight to petrol. This is possible by a phenomenon called water splitting. What is water? H2O. I can use sunlight and a material to create free electrons. So in this case, I have used a material. The sunlight is absorbed in that material. It is excited, so I get an electron in the conduction band and a hole in the valence band. And in presence of water, this water over here, what I can basically do is, if I, if I can tune the material properly, I can split water into hydrogen and oxygen. That is water splitting, okay? And while doing that, you see, I can get some current out of these electrons. I can get a current, right? That means it is possible that if I remix the hydrogen and the oxygen, I will get back that power. That's possible. I split water, make hydrogen and oxygen, and then, if possible, when required, I'll mix this water and oxygen together to generate some power. So sunlight to petrol, okay, I know how to use the sunlight, I will absorb the sunlight in a semiconductor. What about petrol? Where does the word petrol come from? That's my next, next picture. So it is possible that in your car, keep in tank, you can fill up the hydrogen from the roadside and you react hydrogen with the environmental oxygen and you generate that current, okay, that electron. And that electron goes to charge this battery and the battery runs your car. This is hydrogen economy. No carbon emission, no requirement of fossil fuel, okay? However, the only trouble is this water efficiency is very, very lower than 5%. So that's why we are still waiting for this. But once this is possible, you know, we can get rid of fossil fuels totally. And you can see that over here, this is basically a titania particle, titanium dioxide, TiO2, where alt light is absorbed and you get an electron. And how I can use if I this diagram very clearly, you'll see there is a counter electrode, which is platinum. I can downwise this whole system into one nanoparticle. So I have a nanoparticle of TiO2 on which I platinum nanoparticle. Now, can you imagine what, what this can do? So this is a catalytic system. It's a catalytic system which can absorb sunlight. What do? Hopefully, all of you have seen Alan Donald, at least in the in the in, in YouTube or somewhere, you see this this patch of the white thing that he puts as a sun barrier, this one on his on his cheek and nose. Those are basically either zinc oxide or titanium oxide nanoparticles. That will help him protect, protect from the sunlight. Because if you shine sunlight to these materials, it will be absorbed and it will create a uh, Freedom. So that means he is protecting his skin from the sunlight. So that is a catalytic application of uh, metal nanoparticle, uh, metal oxide nanoparticles. 
I come to a completely different. Now, everybody is using light emitting diodes and lasers. I can use semiconductor nano wires, okay? Nano wires means something that look like this, okay? Nano wires, but made up of semiconductors. All of us know that uh, LED is basically a semiconductor P, N junction, and you have to forward bias it. So look at this picture, the picture on the top. So here is the, let's say the P, and here is the N. Uh, in the, it's the opposite. So the top one is the P. So you can see this one is a P, and the bottom one is N. Okay, so here is a PN junction, and if I bias it forward, so that means I am connecting a positive, positive, positive over here and a negative over there, then I can make this system glow, emit light, because these semiconductors they have a band gap. So if you pump electron, if you pump electron, you will get recombination and you will get light. See, we can get light. These are LEDs of nanomaterials, nanowires, on substrate. That means you have a flexible LED that you can bend and roll and do all kind of stuff. Now you might be asking that, well, semiconductors have select band gaps. So either it is emitting blue or green. True. Can we make white LEDs? Of course, make pixels in which you have all the RGB. So here is the R. Here is the blue, here is the G. So this is a complete pixel, and you can manage how much G, how much R, and how much blue you can put. Then you can generate white light. So basically, making this, this light will be white. White light, OK? So white LED is possible by using the semiconductor nanowires. Even lasers are possible. I will not go into the details, so that's it. That's a laser using a cadmium sulfide nanowire on a magnesium fluoride substrate. You can generate a layer out of a nanowire. Remember, the nanowire is not like what you can see. It's it's a few micron in uh, in length and maybe a few hundred nanometers in diameter. That's it, and that will emit very very bright, clean laser lines. That's one of the electronic applications of uh, nanomaterials. Let's come to solar cell. Solar cell is uh, my my topic of PhD. Okay, so a special liking for these materials. So no, you normally know that solar cells are made up of again semiconductor PN junctions. Here you don't need the bias like you need in LED. Here you don't need bias. So you have a PN junction of a material. Let's say silicon falls on it. The silicon absorbs the light and then generate the electron hole pairs on the opposite electrodes, you create some current. However, remember, these semiconductors, their absorption of sunlight is very, very small. So what to do to increase the absorption? First thing, use some materials that has a direct band gap. Remember, silicon has indirect band gap. So its abs optical absorption is very weak. I can increase the absorption by using quantum dots. Quantum dots are direct band gap materials semiconductors okay because they are compound cadmium sulfide cadmium selenide gallium arsenide those kind of compound semiconductors they have very high absorption in this picture they have used quantum dots inside the solar cell so you can increase the efficiency of the solar cell not only that you can use instead of a bulk silicon layer you can use silicon nanowires in this picture you can use silicon nanowires to make solar cells. The absorption will be higher. The efficiency will be much higher than when you use the planar silicon solar cells. So in these two cases, I have told you that if you change the absorbing material with nanomaterials, then you can have a better solar cell. The picture on the right that you see here has a completely different purpose. So normally, you know, when we make solar cells out of uh, thin films, like uh, amorphous silicon thin film solar cells or even PN junction crystalline silicon solar cells, when you, sh when you shine the light, sunlight, nearly 40% is reflected back. That means you are losing 40% of sunlight. But we can't do that. We want to make the most of it. The available sunlight is there. If you nanostructure the top of the material, that, like these, 
nano pyramids, I can say like, like that, okay? Then the reflection can come down to below 1%. And then the absorption of sunlight more, of course, the current will be more. And you can see from this IV diagram that the current has increased. Then you are increasing a monolithic anti-reflection layer. This AR, the word AR that you see, this means anti-reflection. So if you make the top of the solar cell like nanostructure, then the reflection will go down. That means you are getting anti-reflection effect. So you can pump more sunlight into the device. You get more current. That's one more application of nanomaterials. <clears throat> Let's now come to metals, OK? I have been discussing semiconductors, like the quantum dots and uh, uh, silicon nanowires. Are those, those are all semiconductors. Move to gold nanoparticles. We all know what is gold, OK? Expensive stuff and nice looking. So we all know what is gold. So let's make nanoparticles of gold. So these are all gold nanoparticles in colloidal solution. Okay, so those are gold nanoparticles in water, basically. And you see the color. They are not yellow. They are red. They are blue, like that. Okay. Remember now, in this case, gold is a metal, so it doesn't have a band gap. It doesn't have a band gap like a semiconductor quantum dot. So in this case, this is scattering. The color you are seeing is scattering, not emission. The color you saw in quantum dots is emission. But in this case, it's scattering. You shine white light. The white light falls on the nanoparticles. And what scatters is what you are seeing. So you see some gold nanoparticles look red. Some of them look purple. And you can make gold of different shapes and sizes. Nanostars, nanoshell. Nano rod, cluster, cage, sphere, you can make anything. The question is will these gold nanoparticles react to light? That means, will it absorb light or do something with light? Of course. So, you take these uh, small bottles of uh, colloidal solutions of gold and you try to measure the optical absorption. So, what you see is over here. So, if you have a gold nanoparticle, you see they have an absorption, this red line, which is near to 520 nanometer. And if you take a gold nanorod, which is over here, so these are all gold nanorods of different length, of course. <coughs> you can see there are two modes of absorption. One remains at the 520 nanometer. The other one shifts to the IR, shifts to the IR side, OK? For example, uh, this one, this very long nanorod, they have the second mode at near about 850 nanometers. So they have two modes. You will be uh, asking that, okay, gold doesn't have a band gap. So where are these absorption coming from? So these are called plasmon absorption, okay? These are called plasmon absorption. What is a plasmon? You take a gold nanoparticle, you shine light. When you shine light, the electric field of the light is polarizing this nanoparticle, and it becomes a dipole. And because the electric field of light is always flipping around, OK, from this direction to that direction, this dipole also oscillates. When they oscillate, they can absorb light, OK? So basically, gold under irradiation is, a, is an oscillating dipole. And this oscillating dipole can absorb light, and we call the quantum of that absorption as a plasma. What it can do, the plasma and absorption will get rise to will give rise to these colors. Okay, so this plasma will be used later, as I will show you. They they have very very nice uses. For example, uh, look at this. Uh, this is a like like li uh, Lysergus cup kept in the British Museum. It looks red and green when the light is shown from the outside and the inside. So you have to try to find out how the same cup looks red and green at the same time. And this has to do with plasma expression. If you go to some old churches, OK, if you look at the windows, the glass windows, they all have this kind of colored glasses. They are not really pure glass. They have these metal nanoparticles embedded in them. And that's what, what gives them these uh, beautiful colors. Okay. So these are metal nanoparticles, and the color you are getting is, of course, from the plasmonic absorption in these metal nanoparticles. And remember, uh, 
for plasmonic expression the best materials are gold silver and platinum copper can also give any metal can theoretically give but gold silver and platinum these are the only most important material of them all <clears throat> i will move to a different application using gold of course and i show you this picture i don't know how many of you have seen this picture this is called the struggling girl and has been taken in 1990 during the famine of sudan and you see a dying girl starving and there is a vulture waiting over there and this was taken by a south african photographer Kevin Carter, he is a photojournalist, and for this particular image, he got the Pulitzer Prize. However, in one of the interviews, who was interviewing Kevin, he asked that, "Can you tell me how many vultures are there in the picture?" When Kevin replied, "Well, I remember it's one only." Then the interviewer sort of hurt Kevin and said. I think in the picture there were two vultures. One is the one in the picture, and the other one is you. That hurt Kevin really bad. Why the interviewer said that? He said, "You could have taken that struggling girl to the nearest hospital or something, and tried to save her." What Kevin said is that my helicopter was waiting, and then I I need to board that because my other uh, people were waiting over there, and it's already a famine ravaged country so i wanted to leave however he realized his mistake he realized his mistake that uh, indeed he could have saved that girl so what happened is that after a few years he struggled and he committed suicide and the title of the slide that you see over here is his suicide note i am really really sorry the pain of life overrides the joy to the point that joy does not exist and you want to know how this guy died he started his car closed the windows and put the exhaust gas back into his car what happened the exhaust gas of the car contains carbon monoxide co which is a deadly gas carbon monoxide and it died of carbon monoxide poisoning so now what is the purpose of the story in this nano nano gold if you have a particular kind of gold which is only possible if you deposit gold on a crystal of titania tio2 okay a particular type of nano gold can convert this co into co2 which is bad but not deadly so you can have this reaction going co plus half o2 giving co2 so basically you are oxidizing carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide normally carbon monoxide is very unstable if if it finds a uh, an oxygen it will react but the trouble is this uh, carbon monoxide uh, if you this only happens in the cold european countries a lot this happens this kind of death because they will close the window and they will start a heater so once our uh, breathing you know the air we breathe out and they come in contact with the heater they will produce carbon monoxide but there is not enough oxygen from the outside to react and form carbon dioxide back again so you can have lot of deaths like that but those are uh, unintentional deaths but in kevin's case that for the suicide we cannot stop but probably for the unintentional ones that is happening in the cold european countries we can make a surface which is highly catalytic to make this reaction happen from co to co2 then probably we could save a lot of lives so that's one of the applications and you understand that we can make this kind of surfaces in our ac machines or uh, near the heater and then we can force these reactions to happen so this is one example of a catalytic activity uh, that can be done on nano metal surfaces <clears throat> so semiconductors done metals done now let us come to carbon okay carbon is a quite popular material so here you start with diamond the expensive one and then you get to know the cheap one which is graphite so inside your pencil you have that tip which is mostly either lead or graphite so that graphite is basically layers and millions of layers of 
graphene. Okay, so that's that's graphite. You basically have hexagonal sp2 hybridized carbon arranged in a in a lattice. If you can take one of these one of these layer from graphite, what you get is a graphene. Okay, which is quite popular nowadays. Everybody is working on graphene. If you take a graphene and roll it up to make a tube, what you get is a single wall carbon nanotube. SWCNT, single wall carbon nanotube. Okay. If you make many of them, then you get multi wall carbon nanotube. If you roll them up in a ball, what you get is a fullerene. We call the C60 or the fullerene. Okay. So you know for the fullerene, uh, Professor Smalley, Croto, and Curl got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 1996. And for graphene, uh, Professor Novoselov and Gaim got the Nobel Prize in 2010. So these are very you know interesting fields and uh, Professor Ijima, Professor Ijima from Japan, who discovered the single wall carbon nanotubes, he also got uh, many many prizes like Kavli Prize, Balsam Prize, Franklin Medal. He got all these prizes. So this is quite a you know hot topic these days: how to work with graphene, how to make transistors. So I will show you some of uh, what has been done using carbon and graphene, especially. The invention of graphene has changed the face of electronics. So your mobile phones, your computers, they run on semiconductor chips, okay, semiconductor transistors. So they have their limitations. So if, if you look at the mobility of silicon, that's the electron mobility of silicon, 1400 centimeters square per volt second. That's normally the material that is inside your phone and your laptops, okay? If you make the transistors out of graphene, then the electronic mobility is this value, 200,000, okay? Much, much orders higher than that of silicon. So what do you expect? If you have electron moving much faster in, in graphene, then what do you expect? You expect a faster computer, you expect a faster mobile phone. Of course, the number of transistors you can put per unit area increases that much. So recently, IBM made an all graphene uh, IC, integrated circuit. So normally the Intel microprocessors that you have, the transistor sizes are around 45 nanometer. And currently they can downscale the uh, size to around 14 nanometer. The limit of silicon uh, transistors are around seven nanometer. So what can we expect? Can we make them even smaller, 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 and in put more number of transistor that increases the speed. So for example, this paper in 2016, this is published in Science. They are using a MOS2 transistor. MOS2 means molybdenum disulfide. So molybdenum disulfide is a similar material to graphene. It is also layered, okay? However, it's not carbon, it is MOS2. They have made a transistor with one nanometer gate length. So here is the MOS2 layer. If you look at this picture, here is the MOS2 layer. Underneath, there is a zirconia insulator, inside which there is a single wall carbon nanotube. So here is a nanotube. If you look at this picture, it's the same. So here is the zirconia. Now you have the MOS2 is over here, okay? And the carbon nanotube is right over there. Here is the carbon nanotube. With this device structure, they can make transistors of one nanometer gate length. Now you can imagine that how many transistors we can pack per unit area. So this is how graphene is changing electronics overall. Using graphene, what you can do, I, I, I put a list over here. It can be many more than these. Energy, you can, you can make better lithium ion batteries. Biomedical, you can use them for drug delivery sensors, you can use it for light detection, electrochemical, surface enhanced Raman, and all these kinds. So basically the advent of graphene, and after the advent, I mean 2010 onwards, I mean all people are working on graphene, 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 which is just a single layer of transparent carbon. It doesn't have a, uh, uh, it's quite transparent, but the, the basically per layer, you only have 2% absorption of light. So can they be used? Of course they can be used. So in our lab, what we have done is we have made broadband photo detectors. 
it's a quite a simple device. So what, what we did is we took a silicon silica substrate on which we put a layer of graphene, so you can see. And on the graphene, we put some nanoparticles, special nanoparticles. I will not discuss, we call it UCMP, up-conversion nanoparticles, which works as a light absorber. So I take graphene and then I put these absorbers. And then I put two metal electrodes. In this case, it's a silver, okay? And then I shine light. I shine light. When I shine light, these nanoparticles will absorb the light. They create the electrons and the holes. And I apply a bias across these two electrodes, okay? So I can apply a bias, some kind of bias. So you know, whatever uh, light is absorbed over here, the electron will go like this. The hole will go like that. So I will get some current. So <coughs> once you have, once you shine the light, you are generating a current. So in this way, we can uh, detect light. The same work we have repeated with MOS2. So in this work, what you see is basically a layer of MOS2 on which I put the same nanoparticles, make the same device. So this is UCNP on graphene on the left. On the right, what you see is UCNP on MOS2. UCNP means of conversion nanoparticles. And they give very, very high responsivity. Is mentioned over here. Responsivity R in, in this device is nearly 1000 ampere per watt. What is ampere per watt? That means when you shine one watt of light, how much current is generated? So that is 1000 nearly, 1000 ampere per watt. And I am using one volt of bias voltage. That means this one is one volt. And I use a light of 980 nanometers. So the light I am shining is 980 nanometer, which is nearly IR light. Now you would ask me, so what is so special about this? You will understand its speciality when I tell you the normal commercial photo detectors are normally made up, made up of silicon, okay, silicon diodes, silicon photodiodes. So what is the responsivity of silicon photodiode? Okay, silicon photodiode responsivity. So silicon responsivity is one ampere per watt. Now compare this value with that value, then you will know what is so good about this material. Of course, silicon is a proven technology and it's in the market. However, our technology is right now not in the market. We have to develop it, make it into a chip and then you know, go so that there's a long way to go. However, the responsive, uh, responsibility value is much, much, much higher than what you get in silicon. So this is our device. This is our device. That's how it looked like, okay? And there is my, uh, MOS2 and the UCNP, it's right at the, at, the, at the circle over here, you see. It's right, you cannot see, of course, because it is nanoscale, and this is my detector. So the MOS2 flake is over there. This is my MOS2 flake, and this is my contact, the platinum, and these ones that you see, this is the gold. This is the gold means this is gold, okay? This is gold. So... We make this device as a single plate of MOS2 with the UCNPs, and you shine different color of light, you get current. So you see, this one I shine UV light, then I get this current, okay? I shine blue light, I get this current. Green light, then IR light, IR light, far IR light, then you get current. So that basically you are making photo detectors out of these materials, okay? And they are very high responsivity. This is only happening because we are working in a nanoscale. You will ask me, well, okay, uh, photodiode is made, a photo detector is made, so how to use it? So we have tried different, uh, for example, a mobile phone light, okay? So it can, I'm sorry, it can detect uh, uh, the mobile phone light, it can detect a laser pointer, it can also detect the signals from an uh, AC remote, okay? It can also detect like that. The only trouble is the signal from the AC remote is modulated at very high frequencies, let's say 30 kilohertz. So that's why the, uh, the signals are so uh, sharp. I mean, there are many, many lines which you don't see over here. Okay, so this is how we can use this kind of devices for photo detectors and photo detectors are used everywhere in your daylight. <clears throat> Now, 
I will give you another uh, very quick example of how these gold nanoparticles can be used. This is called sensing. Okay, sensing. I, I will like to sense lung cancer non-invasively. Non-invasive. That means you don't have to do any biopsy. Okay, you have, don't have to do any imaging. You won't have to put put yourself inside an MRI machine or a CT machine. In this case, what am I doing? See, this is an example of the use of gold nanoparticles. So I take gold nanoparticles. So these are my gold nanoparticles. I make a cluster. I make it into a big ball, which is this one, which I call the gold super particle. And then I make a box out of a transparent spongy material, which is called ZIF-8. ZIF-8. Okay, what is ZIF-8? It's a complicated thing, don't worry. It's a zeolitic imidazolate framework, metal organic framework. So I make this box outside the gold cluster. How it will help? Okay, now I will make a membrane, let's say on a glass. On glass or a plastic or a polycarbonate, I put all these gold super particles like, like in this picture. Okay, and then I will use it to breathe out because my breath, whatever I am breathing out, contains VOC. What is VOC? VOC is volatile organic compounds. Okay. This VOC. I will breathe out VOC. And these organic compounds are going to penetrate through the network of these Z8 and go towards the uh, gold super particle. Okay, get the idea? So whatever I am breathing out is penetrating or being absorbed by Z8 and taken close to the gold super particle. What will happen? Okay, this is what is going to happen. So the information that we have is ethylene benzaldehyde. This is a lung cancer biomarker. So in case somebody has lung cancer, when he is breathing out, his breath will contain ethylene benzaldehyde. So this benzaldehyde will penetrate through the zip network and go towards the gold super particle. <coughs> now what I'm do, what I'll do, I will do Raman spectroscopy, not conventional Raman spectroscopy, which was invented in ISAS, Indian Association of the Cultural of Science, where I used to work. I never saw that machine, never mind. So in this case, we call it surface enhanced Raman scattering, SIRS. We call it SIRS. Why? Because I am using a metal nanoparticle to enhance the Raman signal. What I will see? I will see, look at this spectrum. I will see some signal coming out. You, you look at that signal. That signal is coming from the benzaldehyde. What you, uh, that is a VOC being breathed out. When I see this signal, I know that in my sample, I have ethylene benzaldehyde. So basically I make a membrane of these gold nanoparticles and I give this membrane to a patient, okay? Now he breathes out on this, like breathe in and breathe out maybe for five minutes. Then I take this substrate, go to my lab, put it inside a Raman spectrometer and then I scan and then I get this signal. If I see that, if, uh, 1623 centimeter inverse signal, I know there is some trouble. If I don't see it, then it's fine. Then the patient is fine. Otherwise, I will probably re uh, refer him to the next level. Okay. So in this way, you can, you can have non-invasive. Non-invasive means you are not cutting, not doing any surgery, nothing. It is non-invasive lung cancer detection just by using this gold super particle. These <clears throat> nanoparticles, can they be used for bioimaging? I showed that uh, quantum dots can be used. So using, for example, this one is a new kind of nanoparticle, like I said, UCNP, upconversion nanoparticle, that we are making in our lab. So we can do multiplexing. That means we can put them into cells, and I can take the fluorescence image. I can do multiplexing means I can put different kind of nanoparticle to emit different light, and I can... Uh, sense all these light together so I can get colorful images. 
However, on the so that's called multiplexing. On the right, what you see is targeted bioimaging. What is targeted bioimaging? That means I will make the nanoparticle and I will do some chemistry. Okay, complicated chemistry. Then I will make this nanoparticle go to a certain tumor because I would like to see that tumor. In this case, what you see, look at the figure A, okay, this one. This mouse has two tumors, okay, marked by the arrows. So one is here, the other one is there. So one is the breast cancer, the other one is a human glioblastoma, uh, U87MG. And what I did, what we, I mean, the researchers did, they injected these nanoparticles with a particular peptide, RGD peptide. You no need to know what is that RGD peptide. So you inject that and what you see, you see the light is coming out of the liver and the light is coming out of the left tumor, which is glioblastoma. Because glioblastoma has peptide RGD receptors, so the nanoparticles will only go to that tumor. It will not go to the MCF7, which is a breast cancer. So you see, with time, of course, with time also you can see this, this fluorescence is coming from one of the tumors, not the other tumors. So this is targeted. That means I target my nanoparticle to go to a certain tumor and I can image that. So that is the use of nanomaterials in imaging. Now you can ask me that what is the guarantee that if you don't target, target the nanoparticle, that means with the chemistry on the surface of the nanomaterial, that it will not go to the tumor. Okay, here is the example on the right. In this case, folic acid is used as a targeting agent. So what is done? HeLa cell, HeLa is basically cervical cancer. So they induce HeLa tumor on the, in the mouse, okay, over there. And then they put in the nanoparticles without the folic acid. What do you see? You only see the nanoparticle giving light from the liver, not from tumor. That means the nanoparticles didn't go to the tumor. <clears throat> However, if you make the nanoparticle with a folic acid coating on the outside, then what do you see? You see the Hila tumor over there. That means targeting really happens. So this can be done. But remember, all of this work is being done on animals, animals and animals, no humans till now. I will tell you, I will move to uh, therapy, okay? Till now I have been talking about imaging, now I move towards therapy. And I will introduce a special kind of therapy called hyperthermia. Hyper means up, thermia means temperature. So that means I will try to treat a disease with increased temperature. So what do I need here? It's quite simple. Till now, I have shown you that quantum dots, gold nanoparticles, or upcon mushroom nanoparticles, they all absorb light. So I need energy absorber. Okay? And then, what, are the, uh, what is the second thing I need? I need an energy source. Then, what is the principle? I will take a cell. So here is my cell. And I can put in different kind of, or one kind of absorber. I can put in some absorber. So this is a gold nanorod. That is a iron oxide, it's a uh, magnetic nanoparticle, or I can put quantum dots, or I can put something, and then I shine different types of energy. For the gold nanorod, I can shine an NIR laser, I can shine the NIR laser, or for the quantum dots, I can shine the UV light. For the magnetic nanoparticle, I can irradiate some magnetic field. Or for other materials, I can use ultrasound. So these are all different kind of energy sources. So what is happening is, I take a cell, I put in the absorber inside, then I shine the energy. The absorber will absorb this energy and convert it to heat. And that, so that will make the temperature of the cell go up. If I can make the temperature go up by around seven degrees, let's say, seven degrees, then it is possible for me to kill the cell. <coughs> yeah, so you can just imagine that our normal body temperature is around 37 degrees centigrade, so which is like 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Increase by 7 degrees, how much do you get? You get like uh, 105 degrees, and when you get a fever of 105 degrees, 
what the doctor tells you or even your mother or grandma tells you the first decrease the fever first put down the fever just just, just put some uh, cold wipes on your forehead okay and then just uh, put down the fever because if you don't put down the fever a uh, fever the temperature will affect your brain cells first so that's dangerous so it's possible that i put these nanoparticles in select cells let's say the cancerous cells in in those select cells and then i kill those cells selectively okay so that's a hyperthermia let me give you some examples in this case this is our work. So what we have done is we have tried to treat melanoma. Melanoma is a something like a, 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 a epidermal, a, a skin cancer kind of thing. It's a skin cancer, okay? So what we did is we take uh, different sets of mouse, okay? We kill a lot of mouse, sorry for that. So we induce the tumors using this melanoma. So you see they had these tumors on, on both, both legs over there. These are the tumors, okay? And then one set of mouse, we will do nothing. So that's our control. We do nothing. We see how the tumor progress with time. But in the other two sets, what we have done is our material that we have used is one is gold nanorod. Gold nanorod absorb IR light. So I will try to use photothermal therapy. PTT is called photothermal therapy. Okay. So I will try to shine a 785 or IR laser to the gold nanorod and try to make it hot because it will absorb plasma absorption and then it will make it hot. And my second material is graphene oxide. My second material is graphene oxide. Not only that, if you look carefully, I have written chemotherapy. So where is the chemo? I have loaded doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is a very popular anti-cancer drug. So I take this graphene oxide and I load doxorubicin in this graphene oxide. Then what I do, I also put the graphene oxide inside the cells. But however, I do it in two different ways. <clears throat> for the one step case, that means look at this panel. For the one step case, we mix the gold nanorod and the graphene oxide and the doxorubicin and inject into the tumor. I am not targeting it. Okay, I am injecting directly into the tumor. And after that, I shine a laser and I see what is happening to the size of the tumor with time, with the number of days here. And in the other case, you see, I have written two step. In this case, what we have done is we have first injected the gold nanorods. And then I shine the 785 nanometer laser. My expectation is that the temperature will go up so all these cancerous cells will be like vulnerable. They will be half dead because the temperature is high. And then I will put the graphene oxide with the doxorubicin to ensure that they are killed. So what do I? What, what do you see from this figure? You see, for the set, the control, I did nothing. The tumor kept increasing. They become very big, and the mouse all all of them died. Okay, but. For the one step case, I could control the tumor volume, but not much. Here on this panel, you can see the tumor sizes and the weights of the tumor. So initially, the weight of the tumor was 5.6 gram after, after nine days. <coughs> when I do the one step treatment, I can reduce the size of the tumor to may maybe 2.7 grams. However, when I did the two step process, that means first I did the PTT photothermal therapy with the gold nanorod and then shine the light so the temperature of the tumor goes up and then i use the graphene oxide with the doxorubicin then i could reduce the tumor size to very small now you see the tumor is only 1.7 grams if you look at this this will give you a better idea that the control keeps on increasing like that the one step treatment i could control the tumor volume but it is still up to here so that's the tumor volume However, for the two-step process, I could decrease the tumor size to near as before. That means when we started. So this is how we did uh, uh, treated melanoma by using chemophotothermal treatment. So I use photothermal PTT as well as chemotherapy, both. Okay. So these are these are like uh, new ways of treating. I don't know when they will come to the hospital, but these are new ways of treating uh, cancers. 
at least we have done that in animal model. <clears throat> this one is again another uh, treatment which is done by light. We call it photodynamic therapy. In photodynamic therapy, we are not killing the cells by temperature. We are killing the cells by a chemical called reactive oxygen species, ROS, reactive oxygen species. What are these? In this case, my nanoparticle will contain a photosensitizer. Photosensitizer, this one. Photosensitizer, OK? When you shine light, what happens is these photosensitizers have both singlet and triplet states. So the electron goes up like that, and they will transfer to the triplet state. And when the ele electron relax back to the ground state, they will interact with the available water or oxygen or hydrogen peroxide, whatever containing oxygen. Then this electron will knock off this knock onto this oxygen and um, will make it a singlet oxygen. What is singlet oxygen? The oxygen that we feel around us is 3O2, this one. 3O2. And you get the electron striking this, it will convert to 1O2. Okay. This is the singlet oxygen, which we call reactive oxygen species. These are toxic to the cancer cells. So if you can produce enough amount of ROS, they can kill uh, the disease cells. I should not say cancer, but disease cells, OK? So in this case, you see, this is a real application from a lab. Bormon will know this one. This is from uh, San Diego. Bormon was uh, for a long time in Los Angeles, so you might know this lab. So this is a cosmetic laser dermatology. So you are basically removing the scar marks on the skin using photodynamic therapy. This can be done using certain kind of nanoparticles. I am giving you an overview. I am not going to the details. <clears throat> so after this, now you know that what nanomaterials can do. But I didn't tell you how to make them. OK? So for the students who are interested in nanoscience, it is very basic to know how these are made. So nanomaterial synthesis basically has two steps, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. What are they? In the top-down approach, you start from a big bulk material, and then you cut them down or you hammer them down to a very small size. So you start from here, and then you hammer them down, make them into small. So that's a top-down process. So what is bottom-up? Bottom-up means you are starting from atoms or molecules or clusters and joining them together to make the nanomaterial. So these are the two basic approaches, top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. Let me uh, give you some examples. So here is a bottom-up approach. That means I will be starting with atoms and clusters and try to make a solid. OK? So I will just give you this uh, particular growth mode called VLS, vapor liquid solid, which is a catalyst-assisted CVD, chemical vapor deposition. In this case, what we do is we take a substrate. You will ask what kind of substrate. OK, silicon or glass or something. And then I, I put some metal nanoparticles, which will act as catalyst. These are the metal nanoparticles, catalyst, OK? These are the catalyst. And remember, when they are very small, they are not solid. Their melting point can decrease. So when they are very small, they are basically liquid. <coughs> so then from the top, I do a plasma radio frequency or normal DC plasma of a gas. Gas of which, uh, what kind of gas? Depends on what material you want to make. So for example, you want to make carbon nanotubes, OK, then your gas must be CH4, methane. CH4, methane, OK? So when you make a methane plasma, the plasma will break the methane gas into carbon atoms. So carbon atoms will come and dissolve in these catalyst particles, in these metal particles, will dissolve. And then the concentration, the solubility, I mean, it keeps on dissolving, dissolving until it gets super saturated. Then the solid carbon will precipitate out as carbon nanotube. So what you see here is that the solid part, OK? So the gas is vapor, the catalyst is liquid, and what is precipitating out is a solid. So you get a VLS growth, OK? So this is a, a carbon nanotube. Now you say, OK, what do I do when I, if I want to make silicon nanowires? Then you change the gas to silane, SiH4. Instead of CH4, you make it SiH4. 
And then what you get is silicon atoms dissolving into the catalyst. The catalyst, of course, are different. We know that. So you can make junctions. Remember the LED, they're made up of PN junctions. So here is the P. So let's say this is a P and that's the N, semiconductors. Okay, so I get a PN junction nanowire, which can work as an LED. I want to give you some examples. So here is the growth of carbon nanotubes. Look at panel B. This is a growth of carbon nanotube at very small time. These are the iron catalysts, okay? That means the schematically I have shown. So these are the iron catalysts. And the iron catalyst is dissolving carbon atoms and just throwing out the carbon precipitate, just like a plant grows, okay? These white things you see, these are the carbon nanotubes coming out. You proceed with this reaction, the carbon nanotube gets longer and lo longer. You see like that? And each time it gets even longer. So this is a <coughs> bottom-up uh, method of growing nanowires. You can ask me, that can I make the nanowires on a specific area? Yeah, of course. Remember, only where the catalyst is present, the nanowire is growing. So I can put the catalyst over here. My nanomaterials will only grow in this. They will not grow on these areas, OK? So I can grow the nanomaterials where I like. So I will deposit the catalyst on that area. Okay? However, there are advantages and disadvantages. Advantage, it is very fast, cheap, large area. The trouble is no control. All the carbon nanotubes that you get, some of them are long, some of them are short, no, no control on them. However, you can grow millions in a very cheap way. On the contrary, so this is what kind of lab condition do you expect? So if you want to do a PhD in, let's say, a nanomaterial, so this is the kind of lab situation you will get to make the nanomaterials bottom-up way. So these are all my lab pictures, OK? <clears throat> On the contrary, now this is a top-down. That means you start from the bulk, and then you cut down and make it into nano size. So for uh, these are all will be lithography processes. We call them lithography processes. What is lithography? So I want to make this blue, this blue material into nano. So I start with a big thick film, then I deposit something on it, which is called a resist. Okay, this one. Resist. It's a photoresist. So the top layer is a resist. Okay, now the important step is I will use a mask, a shadow mask. This is the mask here. I will use a mask through which I will send ultraviolet light. So let's say light with a wavelength of 300 or 400 nanometers. This light will go and strike the resist. When it strikes the resist, depending on the type of the resist, the resist can become hard or soft. So depending on that, we can either keep the resist or etch it off. So in this case, let's say I etch it off. So wherever the light fell, you see the re resist has been removed, has been removed, OK? Then I keep doing this. I use some other plasma etching, and I remove up to here. And then slowly, I remove the entire part. What you get at the end after lift off, what you get is small nanostructures of that blue material I started with. So you get these small blocks. These are nanometer size, of course. However, there is a problem. I am using, this is called photolithography because I'm using light. Photolithography, the trouble is, you cannot make the nanostructure smaller than 200 or 150 nanometer. So you see, all these nanostructures, not only the size of the nanostructure, even the spacing, look at the spacing between them, this. The spacing and the size of the nanostructure, both of them are like 150 to 100 nanometers. So now you will tell that, OK, these are not below the board radius. Then they are not. So what is the solution? The solution is I have to use, uh, uh, you can ask me that, that why, why I cannot take light to a smaller dimension. You cannot take because of the diffraction limit. So if you have a wavelength of light, which is 400, you cannot focus it. Below 200 nanometer, lambda 2. So 400 by 2 is 200 nanometer. You can't focus it because.
because it will be diffraction. So then what is the solution? The solution is you have to use some, some wave which has a smaller wavelength. उन्नी केष कर फोने
হ্যালো স্যার হঠাৎ করে মানে চলছিল নর্মাল ডেস্কটপ সাউন্ডই নিচ্ছিল হঠাৎ করে কোনো সাউন্ড নিচ্ছে না ইউটিউবে কেউ সাউন্ড আসছে না মাইকটা আমার মাইকটা মিউট করা আছে ডেস্কটপ সাউন্ডটা নেওয়ার কথা ডেস্কটপ সাউন্ড নিচ্ছে না হঠাৎ কিছুই করা হয়নি তাও অথচ ডিসপ্লে হচ্ছে না না স্যার না না ডেস্কটপ অডিওটা মুভ করছে হ্যাঁ আমি তো কিছু বুঝতে পারছি না এখানে তো স্টপ স্ট্রিমিং স্টার্ট স্ট্রিমিং স্টার্ট রেকর্ডিং দুটোই করিয়েছি কিন্তু অডিওটা নিচ্ছে না কেন কি বলবো বলুন আপনি স্যার একটা কাজ করবেন আপনি ওই ওবিএসটা খুলে ওবিএস এ জেনারেলে গিয়ে ওখানে যে আপনার স্টুডিও করে দিতে হয় ইউটিউবটা করে দিতে হয় আপনি ওবিএস এ ঢুকুন যদি হবে না মনে হচ্ছে হ্যালো আরে আমি কিছু বুঝতে পারছি না হঠাৎ করে নিচ্ছে না আমি কি বলবো বলো হঠাৎ করে নিচ্ছে না কি বলবো কিছু বলার ঠিক আছে আমি ক্লোজ করে দেখছি রাখো দেখ 